Okay, so plants have mechanical defenses. They can also have phenological defenses. Phenology is the study of the timing of life history events. So when a plant or an animal is born, when it dies, when it reproduces, etc. So the phenology or the timing of reproduction can also be thought of as a defense. It's weird to think of this as being a defense, but basically you can consider it being either going a long time between fruiting, which would then starve any seed predators that rely on you as a food source, or mast fruiting, which overwhelms them by giving them so much food that not all the seeds can be consumed at the same time. So a masting species like a red oak will produce huge crops of acorns, but only every two years. And the thought is that this might be an adaptation that keeps herbivores like these squirrels from consuming their seeds every year and then squirrels might die off in between because they run out of food and then when the red oaks produce their leaves again or they produce their fruits again they produce so many that there's no possible way that these squirrels could eat them all that's masting plants also have biotic defenses and we'll get to the chemical defenses in a little bit but these biotic defenses involve other things other species protecting them so these are the products of mutualisms with insects that defend them. In this case, these acacia ants um, have little hollow thorns, and inside of these thorns are places where ants live. And if you touch this plant, ants will swarm out and bite and consume and attack and sting anything that's touching that plant. They will also, um, these ants will also go all over that plant and any other plant that's touching that plant ants will cut those away so they're removing the predators and competitors of these plants. This is a local example of a plant that has mutualisms with ants that allow them to be protected. Vicia sativa has these little stipular nectaries. They're stipules but there's also they're also nectaries. They're not part of the flowers. They occur at these leaf nodes and they exude sugar as a way of recruiting ants to constantly defend them. If you ever pick up a vicia, you're probably going to be picking up a handful of ants at the same time. Another biotic defense that you learned about back in evolutionary ecology is parasitoids. When an herbivore starts consuming some plant tissue, it starts to wound that plant and mixed with the chemical in the saliva of the herbivore produces a signal that proceeds through the plant that leads to the release of volatile attractant compounds. These volatiles, in other words, things that waft through the air, signal the parasitoids that there is a caterpillar or some other insect that is damaging the plant. They then get recruited to that plant and then they lay their eggs inside of that caterpillar and then those eggs end up killing off the herbivore that was there. A pretty awesome mutualism where the parasitoid gets a message that says its food is available and it's in its present and then the plant gets some kind of defense. Finally, plants have all sorts of chemical defenses. So it might be that the world is green but it's not really food. It's like a green desert. There's no food whatsoever. These chemical plant compounds are often referred to as secondary chemicals because they're not part of the plant's primary chemistry which is the chemistry involved in photosynthesis. So the world may be green but it's not all edible. There are lots and lots of chemicals that deter, poison, or otherwise disrupt herbivores in the herbivory process. One way to think about plant defenses is to consider whether they act in small doses but they might be very potent to a general class of herbivores. We call these qualitative defenses. The downside of this is that they might actually be stimulants, feeding stimulants, to very specialized insects. The examples of some of these kinds of compounds are cardenolides, alkaloids, some of these other very toxic compounds. Or you could think of plant defense compounds being quantitative. These kinds of defenses act in large doses against a broad range of herbivores and they mostly only slow them down. They don't kill them off but they make them susceptible to other uh, sources of mortality, such as competition, other predators, parasitoids, etc. Another way to think about chemical defenses, and this is how we're going to talk about them for the rest of the time, is to think about them as being palat palatability or acceptability influencers or deterrents or inhibitors. 
that's the first class, or digestibility reducing compounds, that's the second category, or finally the broadest category, just flat out toxic compounds. Let's go through each of these in order. First, palatability influencers. These can happen before the herbivore ever comes along and attacks the plant, pre-chomping influencers. These are volatile compounds that make a, a plant smelly, uh, maybe glandular trichomes that produce these smells that repel herbivores. Although, as I said before, er specialized herbivores might think of that as, hey, that's good food. I can smell something really yummy there. Or these palatability influencers could be post-chomping or post-attack. They are internal compounds that might lead to uh, astringent taste like in oaks, um, that tangy sweet taste like oxalic acid and sorrel, sorrels, um, calcium oxalate like we talked about earlier, or foranocoumarins that lead to photosensitization. They might also be bitter cyanogenic glycosides. The next category is digestibility reducers and I listed off several other things there too. These might be tannins or franocoumarins, that's another example. Um, franocoumarins can actually be in a couple different categories. They reduce assimilation of plant proteins by herbivores. In other words, they keep herbivores from being able to digest that tissue. They do that by interfering with enzymes or, or um, detoxification processes inside of the herbivores uh, digestive system. So the herbivores can eat a lot, but they don't actually turn it into herbivore body tissue. So it's like eating a bunch of really terrible food. That means that they grow more slowly. They might fail to develop in a suitable season. They might be longer uh, exposed to predators and other enemies. One example of this is different hormonal defenses that plants produce. This is a kind of digestibility reducer that limits herbivore reproduction. Abies, these fir trees on the left, produce an insect anti-metamorphosis hormone. So the herbivores can keep eating if they're in larval stages, but they can't turn into adults. That's not so good in the first year because the insects can still eat as larvae, but they don't ever turn into adults, so that means lower populations of herbivores next year. And we've mentioned before that yams, like this one on the right, produce hormones that inhibit reproduction in mammals also a decent strategy for keeping herbivore populations down in the future. The third class of these defensive compounds is toxins. These include examples like cardiac glycosides in Asclepius that we've mentioned before, the milkweed plants, um, other kinds of things where cows and sheep are, eat those plants or other kinds of um, herbivores eat those plants and they have spontaneous abortions. These also would be um, considered in the toxin category. We know a lot about these different kinds of applications of these sorts of defensive chemicals, but in most cases we don't know how these compounds impact their target herbivores. And there's a huge bunch of these compounds that we don't have any idea how they work biochemically or whether they might be useful medicinally. This is a great area to go into. Let me give you an example on the left of some important defense compounds that we do understand fairly well. This is a castor plant. The toxicity of raw castor beans is due to the presence of a compound known as ricin. Ricin is acetylcholinesterase inhibitor that has sometimes been used as a poison. Although the lethal dose in adults is considered to be four to eight seeds, reports of the actual poisoning are relatively rare. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, this is the world's most poisonous common plant. I have one of these growing in my side yard. As long as you don't eat the seeds though, you're fine. There's a bunch of other really cool secondary compounds that we do understand the, the mode of action and how they work in some cases against these herbivores. Here's how people use some of these things. THC in marijuana is an alkaloid, which is a nitrogenous secondary compound. Mustards, members of the Brassicaceae, contain glucosinolates, another nitrogenous case of defensive compounds. And this plant produces this mustard oil bomb, as I've mentioned before, that you can feel in wasabi when you eat it. Queen Anne's lace, something that is related to carrots, but not the same as wild carrot, in the family Apiaceae, contains lots of different kinds of foranocoumarins, which are a kind of flavonoid, which is a phenolic carbon-based compound. And tobacco, member of the Solanaceae, contains nicotine, which is another kind of very, very potent alkaloid. 
we would think of a lot of these as being um, qualitative plant defense compounds, but also as toxins. Let's talk a little bit about phenolics. Phenolics are a class of compounds that play many roles in plant defense, but also they do lots of other things for properties of plants as well, including uh, making wood be tougher and stronger, coloring fruits um, because of the compound anthocyanins, or class of compounds known as anthocyanins. They make some plants taste very astringent. They interact with other kinds of plant phytohormones. They can be free radical scavengers. They can signal gene expression. They form the suberin layer of cell walls. And they're also involved in a lot of different plant defense compounds. Alkaloids are another class of plant defense compounds. They are often nitrogenous, and as I've said before, they are typically bitter and active in very low doses. Quinine, paclitaxel, and vinblastine are famous examples of medicinally very important alkaloid compounds. Here are a couple other ethnobotanically important alkaloids, atropine and cocaine. Cocaine, I don't really need to say much about that. It's a very culturally important drug, but atropine is one that you maybe haven't heard quite as much about. I might have mentioned earlier on that, that this compound has a connection to witches, but it's also used in eye drops to dilate your eyes. In the 1600s, this plant compound became known as belladonna, which means beautiful woman. It was beautiful women because women would put these drops in their eyes, their eyes would dilate, and they lo would look really big and really dark, which is what an attentive, beautiful woman would look like in the 1600s. Atropine has also been used as components of some pesticides, and in current days, atropine is used during some surgeries to reduce saliva and to slow heart rate. Terpenoids are another class of compounds that are often repeated chains of isoprene units. With different numbers of isoprene units, these compounds have different properties. Many of these compounds are volatile, which means that they get transferred through the air. Terpenes and terpenoids are the primary constituents of the essential oils, so a lot of the smells and tastes that you get from many plants, and also of many medicinal plants and flowers. Here are some ethnobotanically important terpenes. Alpha-pinene is an anti-inflammatory, it aids in memory, and it's also an antibacterial compound, and it's found in pine needles. Linalool is an anesthetic, anticonvulsant, analgesic, lowers anxiety, and it's something that's found in lavender plants. There's a whole bunch of these very important ethnobotanically useful terpene compounds. So remember that when a plant looks like it's just sitting there peacefully defenseless, it's actually waging an ongoing war with all manner of natural enemies. I'll end this encouraging you to pause and have a look at this cartoon because I think it nicely captures our difference in perspective between humans and the plants and the other pathogens and pests that they are faced with every day.